we have Ali Diab from Collective Health. Uh, Ali has, uh, has his own personal journey that he's bringing um, and a great story of his company. But in, in getting to know Ali uh, and, and doing some research on him, an amazing entrepreneur, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, and sharing with you his, his story. Uh, Ali was the co-founder and CEO at Quilt. He was a Series A investor and the head of product and business operations at AdMob, uh, which was a very successful company. And in and, and being a Series A investor, he made the bet at the moment the bet needed to be made before it was something. Uh, Ripple TV, Yahoo and Microsoft, BuildPoint, started out in financial services at Goldman Sachs. Uh, he speaks four languages. Um, he has uh, multiple patents and not just sort of random patents with uh, uh, random folks, but he's on patents with, uh, with Jeff Weiner and, and Chi Lu, who are both uh, incredibly uh, successful entrepreneurs and innovators. Um, and he, he has uh, uh, gone to both Stanford and, and Oxford. So someone who has had a great uh, track record and trajectory already in your career and someone who, uh, as he sat down to think about what he was going to do next, had sort of unlimited options, I'm sure, in front of him. So um, thank you for joining us and Thanks we're looking for forward me. to hearing your story. So uh, why don't, for everybody's benefit, um, at a real high level, maybe just give an overview of what Collective Health is and, and the mission that you have set out to, uh, to, uh, to execute upon. Collective Health is a startup. Um, we're a health insurance company for companies. What that means is we do everything that health insurance companies do, but for organizations. And specifically what we do is we enable companies to self-insure their health benefits versus buying traditional health insurance like you would from you know, a big health insurance carrier. So basically companies use us to process claims, to provide customer service for their employees and their dependents, and then to pay for the health care of their employees and their dependents. Got it. And you know, we had a chance to visit before this. Uh, what kind of aggregate numbers are we talking about in terms of the, 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 the market opportunity and just the waste in the system right now that you sort of say that's, that's generally the total addressable market US that we're thinking about in terms of where you're headed into? So what's the scale of the problem, if you will? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the numbers are pretty well known in terms of how big the health sector is in this country. We spend nearly $3 trillion a year on health services. Uh, about a trillion of that or a third is, is in the private sector and 90% of that, so about $900 billion is spent by organizations to cover their employees and their dependents. Yeah. So it's roughly a $900 billion market. Um, I have to be careful because Peter Thiel is one of my investors. I don't want to overstate the size of the market. Um, the market that we're addressing is significantly smaller. Um, not because we don't think that entire market is actually addressable, we do, but in terms of being focused as a startup, you need to sort of pick an angle in the market and a slice of it that's big enough for you to be able to prosecute quickly um, with a strategy that scales. So we're focused on sort of mid-sized to larger sized employers that are already self-insured, but would like more transparency, better access to data, and a better understanding of what's driving the healthcare cost trends for their population. All right. And so, and Peter Thiel's an investor and invader too, so we're... Uh we're uh, uh, You're lucky. We're cousins. Um, uh, so far, you guys have scaled a little bit bigger. The um, the uh, if you think about as you began the business um, and you thought about sort of the the, the MVP, the, the minimum viable product, the problem that you were going to go after first. What what was that problem? What is that problem? And um, how did you come to realize that was the thing that you were going to pinpoint? Um, as being the, the leverage point that you could build a, biz a big business around? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I didn't really have that clear of a vision when I thought about starting something in the health insurance sector. Um, I think my story is relatively, I think, well-known among this audience. But for me, this was a very personal mission. I had, you know, I had just gone through a very difficult health scare, and I was shocked, honestly, that my health insurance company didn't want to pay for most of my health care bills, even though I thought I was on the best health insurance plan out there. And so for me, it was more of just like indignation of like, why am I being treated this way that drove me to start to look into like, why does this industry behave the way that it does? And, you know, I, along with one of my co-founders, Roger, who's our chief health officer, spent months reading everything from the Affordable Care Act to every book that we could get our hands on about the industry, talking to every in industry insider and executive that would meet with us to understand the sort of motivations and incentives 
that make payers or health insurance companies more broadly do what they do. And we discovered this phenomenon of self-insurance, which was an undeniable trend that mo more and more large companies in this country were headed toward, where they were not buying health insurance in the traditional sense from health insurance carriers. They were just using the carriers as plan administrators and actually paying for their employees' costs out of pocket. And we were like, oh, that feels like a more aligned way to do things, because at the end of the day, if you're an employer, you want healthy, you know, productive employees for the long run, so your incentives are largely aligned. And with that comes actually a lot of flexibility in terms of how you design your healthcare plan, you know, access to data, transparency around what drives healthcare costs for your population. And then I think, like I said earlier, you know, an aligned set of incentives where you're encouraged to actually invest in your employee or your population's health sort of ahead of the curve to keep them healthy and prevent bad things from happening to them down the road, which you don't necessarily see in the traditional health insurance market. And I want to go back to something at the beginning part of that also because this, this group is both folks in the health industry but also a lot of entrepreneurs who are starting to think about how they're going to ramp up their businesses. Um, you guys did a tremendous amount of research before you got started. So this wasn't something where you started it, you kind of put something against the wall, saw what did, failed fast, figured it out again, you know, and went back around. I'm sure there was iterations, but it sounds like from talking to you that you actually had a quite a journey before even launching the business. Um, can you talk about when you guys first had the idea and, and then the, the progress before you really started to think about actually building a product? Yeah, so I was hospitalized on March 13th, 2013. Uh, I was discharged in mid-April. And I spent probably two, two and a half months just recovering. I, I'd lost 40 pounds and you know, I was like very, very, very anemic at the time. And so I, you know, I came home to a mountain of bills and was just trying to understand, get my strength back and understand like, okay, where am I? What do I need to do? How much do I owe? What's my exposure? Just trying to do all this sort of blocking and tackling of paying for what just happened to me. Um, and then sort of in the May, June timeframe, I started to receive, you know, decline, denial of coverage forms from my insurance company. And I was like, what, what are these? And then they kept coming and I was like, whoa, this is like a lot of money that's not being covered. And that sort of got me to start calling my insurance company and calling Stanford Hospital and trying to understand why things were being declined. Um, and through the course of, I'd say the summer of 2013, from May probably through the end of July, early August, I basically spent time just trying to figure out why things weren't being paid and what I could do about it. And toward the end of that period, I, I grew increasingly frustrated. And so I called one of my friends, who's one of my co-founders, who was finishing his internal residency program at Stanford at the time. And I was like, hey, man, I'm, I'm going through this. Is there anything you know, I should do that I don't, don't know about? Um, do you see this? And he was like, hey, look, I'm really sorry. I actually deal with this very frequently. And people are actually often more concerned about being able to pay for care than the care itself, um, at least at the patients that I see at Stanford. And I was like, okay, well, it sounds like it's not just me then who has this issue. And I think it sort of sparked something in him because you know he's an MD, PhD, a guy who'd spent his career in policy as well as actually as a practitioner. And about a month later, he called me back. He's like, hey, are you still having issues with your health insurance company? I was like, yeah, but I'm working things out with Stanford and I might be able to get a break there. And he was like, why don't we meet and talk? Because I'm also kind of frustrated just being like this single practitioner in a massive system and maybe we can do something. And so through the course of you know, a few coffees and as I recovered like a couple of like easy bike rides on a Saturday morning, we were like, let's do something. Like when you're done with your residency in you know, December, which was you know, a few months away, why don't we try to start something and try to fix the system? So I'd say from August to December, we just spent, I spent like probably eight hours a day just reading, reading everything I could get my hands on. I read the Affordable Care Act cover to cover. I read the Transformation of American Healthcare. I read everything published by pretty much every major sort of medical policy figure in the United States. And you know, I, I got a pretty decent picture of how the U.S. healthcare system works. I talked to people, my family were physicians and policymakers, and so you know, I think over the course of four to six months, we kind of formulated our plan of attack, if you will. Good. And and if I understand correctly, starting with essentially helping people understand what coverage they have, what benefits they have available to them, is the front end, if you will, of the current offering. But the back end is once people understand that it significantly reduces all the downstream churn that goes on with not just, which isn't good for the provider and isn't good for the consumer, um, of, of problems in what's covered, problems and benefits. It's an incredibly uh, suboptimal environment. So could you speak to sort of the front end of your offering and then all the sort of chain of events that help your customers be more efficient and the industry be more efficient downstream? And how, how is that going to sort of, how is it improving today and how is that going to change things in terms of 
as this industry becomes more efficient through services like yours, hopefully that, I'm assuming, frees up resources to do better care and, and you know, do more for people versus just sort of fixing the messes that are created by an inefficient system. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I think it kind of speaks to the work that we did just trying to understand what the problem was. And I remember early on, we stumbled across a couple of papers written by a professor at Carnegie Mellon named Roger Lowenstein. And there was a statistic in one of the papers that just is like burned in my mind, which is only 14% of Americans across all socioeconomic classes understand what one of the following four things, one of the following four things in a health plan means. Copay, coinsurance, deductible, out-of-pocket max. So if one out of only if only one out of every eight Americans understands what one of those things means, I was like, well, how can we expect consumerism in healthcare? Like everyone's talking about consumerism and giving consumers choice and giving them access to their health record and having them decide from 50 different plans in a public exchange. That sounds all well and good if people actually know what it is that they're picking and they understand their criteria by which to pick those things. It's not like you're buying beer or shampoo, you're buying a health plan and there's a lot of economic intricacy to most of them. So superficially, one of the first things we set out to fix was just communicating what's covered in a sort of plain English third grade literacy level. Because when I read my 128 page health insurance plan document, I was like, I don't understand what 60% of these terms mean. And I'm a pretty well-educated person. I can only expect that many other people don't understand what any of these terms mean. And to your point, it's sort of like a fan where if you don't understand what's covered, then you go in potentially to a hospital or to a practitioner to have a service delivered, and you don't actually know whether or not it's covered. And then when you have that rude awakening and discover that it's actually not covered, that creates all sorts of cost in the system where you're on the phone, you're using up valuable, valuable call center time for your health insurance company or your you know, hospital or doctor's office, and it creates this massive fanning of cost in the system. And depending on whose statistics you believe, but you know, there's a very famous healthcare economist at Princeton named Uwe Reinhardt who publishes statistics on this pretty frequently, roughly 10% of cost in the US healthcare system or around $300 billion is just waste from those kinds of errors. Right. And so imagine if you just fixed those errors, that's like an industry the size of the software industry that you're actually just removing by fixing those errors. And, and are you seeing from the currently self-insured organizations, but you've also said that it could be beyond that downstream, um, are, are you seeing, I mean those organizations were in existence before they, I'm assuming began to use your platform, are you seeing in the beginnings of them rolling out the results as they can measure them of being having much greater clarity up front, translating to reduced um, excess and reduced churn on the back end. Yeah, I mean, it's still early days for us and for our customer cohort, but the data for self-insured employers is pretty compelling. I mean, the trend for most self-insured employers is roughly in line with the consumer price index whereas health insurance premium trend is significantly higher than that. It's an order of two or three times higher than that. And we're already seeing that in the early stages of our own customer cohort. And then from an operations standpoint, just by doing things sort of clearly and using machines in the way that machines should be used, which is to do large scale repetitive tasks that humans aren't very good at, we've noticed our operations load and overhead versus sort of the industry or health insurance industry standard to be actually about an order of magnitude lower. So we need literally one tenth the number of operations personnel to do the things that a traditional health insurance company would do. Because we use machines to do a lot of things that they would use people to do. That's great. Um, so a couple minute warning for folks. There's some mics here. Uh, in a couple more questions, I'm going to open up to the audience. So if you have a question, uh, start formulating it and we can get some audience participation. Uh, there's about nine, ten minutes left in the, in the talk. Um, in terms of now, uh, leaving the specific business aside, jumping back to the entrepreneurial side of things and thinking through just how this business got off the ground. Um, as you look back and you think about your, your Series A presentation and, and the, the business plan you put together, um, and, and you sort of, if you had that behind us now, how similar is that to where you are today? Is, and, and how much deviation and where were there big changes or not? And, and how well do you feel like that plan translates to the, the now it's a you know, full going concern with a substantial body of work behind it? 
Yeah, I mean, I think maybe not surprisingly because we did so much re research up front, it actually hasn't deviated all that much. Um, you know, the business that we're trying to build is in some ways not unlike a business like Tesla or SpaceX where there's a significant amount of fixed cost up front, but there's a pretty clear blueprint of what it is that you want to accomplish, whether it's building a car that's electric or sending a payload, you know, to Mars or to space, you know, using a rocket, a reusable rocket. And so I think one thing I'll, I'll say that's a little bit tangential but related is that one of the things that became clear to us in doing our research was that if we wanted to do something meaningful, it had to be something meaningful. Like it had to be something audacious and big. And you know, in a, in a valley that tends to, at least lately among consumer startups, reward rapid iteration and sort of momentum and things like that, it was you know, a bit of a qualifier in terms of the kind of investors that we were also gonna look for. We were looking for investors who would be willing to write a big check and to have conviction to sort of stay the course for potentially a decade or more without you know, the kind of momentum that you'd get from backing you know, a Facebook or a Snapchat or something that you could very quickly see whether or not it was trending. And I was fortunate enough through one of my fraternity brothers from college to get an introduction to Founders Fund. And it was just like an immediate sort of melding of the minds with that investment partnership because those are the kinds of bets they like to make. It's a very sort of traditional venture capital in the kind of classical sense. And so they're like, yeah, we get that this is gonna take probably 10 years. We get that it's probably gonna take hundreds of millions of dollars to do correctly, but you know, we've been doing that with SpaceX and Stemcentrics and all these other companies that we've backed. So you know, we're happy with that kind of risk. And so I, I think that it's a bit of a lesson, I think, to entrepreneurs. I think you have to match the kind of investor that you're looking for with the kind of problem that you're trying to prosecute. So, so Mapping out, doing a great deal of research, mapping out the course to a very hard problem in a, in a highly regulated industry. Um, you know, a, amazing pedigree here, but not someone yourself who came from healthcare. So imagine you no experience whatsoever. Yeah, so you, you, except for just being really pissed off at the system, um, and motivated. Yeah, motivated, and then uh, and then having a co-founder who it sounds like did come from the system. Uh, last question, then we'll open to the audience. What? Um, what were the other team members that did you, was it the two of you or did you build out a bigger team as you went to sort of go, go make that, that conversation with the investment community? Because it's impressive. You go out, you, you get top tier long term investors on basically a plan. And uh, that's, that's a, that's, everybody here would love to do that. It's a very hard thing to do. So what did that team in the room and what did your early founding team look like sort of pretty much out of the gate uh, to, to, to be able to put together the compelling investment thesis for the investment community uh, that was able to get you guys funded and get the long-term view of the, of the business? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're four co-founders. So in addition to Roger, who's the MD-PhD and our chief health officer, there's Preston Tollinger, who's our CTO, who's a CMU, a serial entrepreneur, CTO, um, as a co-founder. And then Kent Kersey, who's our chief legal officer, is a Stanford JD MBA, was an Army Ranger platoon commander in Iraq for you know, five years, so somebody who really understands how to manage risk, understands the law, is not daunted by sort of scary environments. And that was sort of the core founding team, and I felt like that represented the vectors that we needed. It represented somebody who had passion and an eye for design and product, which is me, you know, somebody who understood the subject matter in terms of healthcare and policy and the implications for the system, and Roger, somebody who understood the law and the need to be very compliant and follow regulations to the letter of the law. And then somebody who was technically very proficient, somebody who had written algorithms to send Mars rovers out into space and to autonomously drive on the surface of Mars. So we had a very sort of strong founding team. And I think that's one of the things that gave our early investors comfort that, yeah, even though these guys don't yet have a product, if anyone can build it, you know, these guys can. Great. That's a great team. Okay. Let's, uh, let's open up to the audience. Uh, questions. Um, there's some mics here. Uh, do anybody want to hop up and ask something? No? One? All you guys got it all figured out. Yeah, okay. Did you ever count on the balance? Is that is that a scenario that you guys have had 
experience with. So it, it happens. I personally never had that happen to me during the course of my illness, maybe surprisingly, but I've had it happen through the course of you know my daughters being treated for something and receiving sort of that balance bill on the back end. And oftentimes, I mean, in every case, I've called the provider system that sent it and said, hey, my insurance company has paid for it. Here's the EOB that I received. And they've often, not often, in every case, they've waived that balance bill, but it does occur for sure. And this is actually emblematic of the problem with the system where provider systems don't talk to payer systems in any kind of relational sense. And so an object in one payer's database has no notion of state in a provider's database and things are just passed very linearly back and forth between these systems. And I think the vision that we have for how things are paid for in the system looks much more like the retail sector where everything is incredibly up to date and everything is relationally loaded and mapped, whether you're the person actually paying the bill or you're the one on the end or you're whether you're the person on the end receiving payment for that service rendered. Yeah, that's, sorry yeah, about that. I, yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your, your, your spouse. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's the number one cause of personal bankruptcy in this country for a reason, I think. I mean, we recently just ran a survey of a couple of thousand Americans, and literally 75% of them aren't ready for an unexpected medical expense of just $5,000. So imagine if it's something that involves an ICU visit where you'd spend that much in just one night in the ICU, if not twice that much. So yeah, there's a reason why you know, it's such a source of financial pain for this country. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, to answer the second part of your question, we're not a managed care organization, so we don't actually sort of steer people in one direction or another. We, we're a plan administrator. But the user experience or the benchmark, 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 I should say, for our user experience is you know, sort of Zappos or Amazon, you know, not your traditional health insurance company. Um, health insurance companies, along with tobacco companies, are at the very bottom in terms of customer satisfaction from a net promoter score standpoint, with the exception of one insurance company, which is USAA, which happens to actually have the highest net promoter score of any company in this country, even higher than Apple or Amazon. And if you can do it in sort of one insurance vertical, we feel like you should be able to do it in the health insurance vertical. And you know, we say stuff internally like we want people to love their health insurance, just like they love Apple or just like they love USAA. You talk to people who use USAA. We have a bunch of people in our company who do. I don't, but we have a bunch of people in our company who do. They absolutely love that company. It would never think about moving their property or home or other kind of insurance anywhere else. And that kind of loyalty is what we're striving toward. And our NPS today kind of reflects that. I mean, it's not quite USAA's, but it's, it's getting close and it's significantly higher than the industry average in health insurance. Well, Thanks everyone for uh, for coming and uh, and participating, and listening to Ali. Ali, thank you for your thank you. for your uh, contribution to the event and for helping these folks get down the get down their own path. So thanks. Great. <laughs>